All right, section 5.3 is exponential function. So what we're going to do in this section is we're going to practice using a calculator, so you will need your calculator out. In this problem, we're going to practice using our calculator, and I'm assuming that everybody has a calculator face that looks similar to this. So if you're given this to simplify, 2 here is the base. You would input the 2 to begin with, and then this is the button we use on our calculator to raise things to a power. And in this case, for part A, we're going to raise this to the 1.4 power. So we just type in 1.4, hit Enter, and we get our answer. Part B, you hit 2nd, Enter, it brings back the last thing you typed in. So I'm going to hit 2nd, Enter, again, because on Part B, we're just adding one more decimal place, 2 raised to the 1.41. You hit Enter, and the numbers are very, very similar. And for Part C, we're going to go out another decimal place, 1.414. We hit Enter, get another answer. So this is Part A, Part B, and Part C. Now we're going to do D and E on the calculator. For part D, we have 1.4142. Hit enter. And then part E, we actually want to raise 2 to the square root of 2. And on your calculator, you still do 2 raised to a power. Only now we want to put in the square root. So we're going to hit second x squared, and that gives us the square root symbol. And then 2. Hit enter. And notice the answers are very, very similar. Because if you did the decimal approximation of the square root of 2, this is what you would get. And this is the power that we were raising 2 to as we just kept adding decimal places. So I just kind of wanted to point that out. But make sure you know how to use your calculators in order to raise numbers to powers. So that's part C, part D, part E, and that's just what the exponent was going to be. Next we have laws of exponents. Ladies and gentlemen, you should have these memorized already. If you do not, make sure you put this information on a note card and you just keep it handy as you're doing your homework and they will come back. If you multiply with a common base, you end up adding the exponents over that common base. If you raise a power to a power, you multiply the exponent. This is the reason the square root would distribute, because if you have a product raised to a power, that power distributes across multiplication. Well, the square root we could rewrite as a rational exponent. If you have the square root of something, that's the same thing as x raised to the one-half power. This property is not on here, but you need to know it. If you have a base, raised to a rational power, you can rewrite that as the nth root of a to the m, or you can rewrite it as the nth root of a raised to the m. It doesn't matter which you do first, the root or the exponent. If you're dividing with a common base, you subtract the exponents. So we would also have a to the m divided by a to the n. That's a to the m minus n. That property is not written down, but it kind of goes hand in hand with this one. Or if you use the negative exponent, you get the same results. A negative in the exponent just means that base is on the wrong side of the vinculum. The vinculum is what we call this fraction line. This is the form in which we write an exponential function. All right, an exponential function using function notation written in this form we call an exponential function where a is a positive real number. We can only let the base be a positive real number. It has to be greater than 0 and not equal to 1 because 1 raised to any power is 1, and that would be a constant function. c cannot be equal to 0, otherwise you lose your exponential expression. What's the And the domain of this set of numbers is going to be all real numbers. Base a is called the growth factor. C we call the initial value because A raised to the 0 when we start out initially, typically with time equals 0, we end up with C, our constant value. So this is called an exponential function. This is a definition that should be from college algebra, usually is where you see this. For an exponential function, if X is any real number, this property is going to hold. This looks complicated, but it, what it says essentially is, is if we take a ratio of consecutive terms from x to x plus 1, we end up with this growth factor, the constant a. We're going to use this now to figure out whether or not a list of values is going to be an exponential function, a linear function, or neither. 
All right, the instructions here for this problem say to determine whether the given function is linear, exponential, or neither. For those that are linear, find a linear function that models the data. For those that are exponential, find an exponential function that models the data. If it's neither, we're not going to worry about a function. So what we're looking at essentially is a t-chart. There's the t-chart. If x goes from negative 1 to 0 to 1 to 2 to 3, we're increasing by 1 each time. What happens to the y values? Well, if we look at a ratio, because that's what this says exponential functions will do, they'll give us a constant ratio here. If we look at 2 over 5, this is the x plus 1 term if this is the x term. f of x plus 1 over f, f of x. That ratio is 2 fifths. And then we progress to the next one. Let's let x be 0. And now the x plus 1 term of the next term up would be 1. So we end up with negative 1 over 2. These are not the same values. So we know right away that a is not exponential. Because there's not a constant ratio that keeps appearing here. So the next question is, is it linear? Because we're either looking at exponential, linear, or neither. Well, if things are linear, they progress with a constant, steady increase of rise over run, which means the difference in the y values will be the same number. If this is 3, this is 3, right? If we rise 2, run 3, rise 2, run 3, that's how we progress each time. So let's look at the difference between these numbers. If we move from 5 to 2, what have we done? Subtract 3. If we move from 2 to negative 1, what have we done? Subtract 3. From negative 1 to negative 4. So it looks like this is going to be a linear function because we're progressing at a constant linear rate. So we're going to say that this is linear. This is the linear form. What do you think we're going to plug in for m? No, m is the slope. What is the change, the rate of change? Negative 3. What's our y-intercept? B is the y-intercept. 2. The y-intercept is what you get when x is 0, y is 2. So this would be the linear equation that these points model. As x moves one unit to the right, y is going down or being decreased by a constant 3. That's the y-intercept. This plus 2 came from the y-intercept. And a y-intercept you get by letting x be 0. When x is 0, the graph intersects the y-axis. All right, let's look at b. The first thing we want to check for is an exponential. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the ratio, just like we did before. Look at the ratio of the m plus 1 term over the nth term. So if we start out at negative 1, the x plus 1 term would be 0. And if we look at a ratio of the x plus 1 term over x, we get 16 over 32. And 16 over 32 2 will reduce to 1 half. Then we check the next term. Look at the ratio. And we get 8 over 16. And that is 1 half. We can't stop after just 2. We need to check. But look at these y values. Half of 32 is 16. Half of 16 is 8. Half of 8 is 4. Half of 4 is 2. It looks like it stays at a constant rate. So it's exponential. So we have y equals some constant times a to the x. a in this case is going to be what? 1 half. Now we've got to figure out what that constant value is out here. See, that comes from this theorem. It says that a on this function is going to be the ratio of consecutive terms. And then how do we get c? We get c by looking at the value of the function when a is 0. So here, when x is 0, c is 16. We get these points if we graph 16 times 1 half raised to a power of x. On part c then, let's check and see if these are exponential. Look at the ratio of the two numbers. To go from 4 to 2, 4 divided by 2 is 2. 7 divided by 4 is not 2. So we know that it's not going to be an exponential. So the next thing we check for is linear. So checking for linear. To go from 2 to 4, we did what? Add 2. To go from 4 to 7, we added. It's not linear. And we're adding one more each time. This is not a linear function. So this is neither exponential nor linear. And we were not asked to find that function then that would yield those points. But we do observe a pattern. It's just not a constant pattern like it was when it was a linear function. And it's not a constant ratio like it was when it was an exponential function. 
so we don't worry about that. Now, I do want to point out the difference between exponential functions and power functions, and I don't think I made a point of this in the note. If we have this, these are called power functions because the base is the variable and they're raised to a constant power. These are exponential functions. Do you see the difference between power functions and exponential functions? In exponential functions, the base is a constant and the variables in the exponent. So in power functions, the variables raised to a power. In exponential functions, the variables in the exponent. All right, moving on. We're going to be graphing exponential functions here. If you have no idea what the graph looks like, what did your high school teacher tell you to do? Plot points. See, in kindergarten, we give you the dot to dots to, to discover what the picture is. The main difference between kindergarten and college is in college, you got to come up with your own dots. We're still going to do dot to dot, but we got to come up with our own dots. And how we do that is we plot points. Before we start randomly picking numbers for x, because we know this is a function, we know that it's going to pass the vertical line test, we have to ask ourselves, are there any values that x cannot be? Can I raise 2 to positive powers? Yes, I can. Can I raise 2 to negative powers? Yes, I can. Can I raise 2 to a power of 0? Yes, I can, which means there's absolutely no restrictions on these numbers that I can plug in for x. So I'm going to take some positive numbers, some negative numbers, and see what happens. Typically, interesting things happen to a function around 0. So I'm going to pick the same number of numbers to the left and the right of 0. So we're going to start out with negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. Now, if you like, you can grab your calculator. But I prefer to understand the reason that, you know, quite frankly, the calculators work and you can use them. But if we had x equal to negative 3, what do we do when we know a value for x in order to get the y value that corresponds to it? We plug that in in place of x. Now, negative exponents can be troublesome, so we want to get rid of the negative. This is the same thing as what raised to the third, not negative 2, 1 half. If you look back at the property of exponents and you have a power that's negative, all you do is you flip that base. So 1 half to the third is 1 eighth. What are we going to get for y when x is negative 2? A fourth. What about when x is negative 1? And when x is 0, anything raised to a power of 0 is 1. When x is 1, 2 to the first is 2, 2 to the second is 4, and 2 to the third is 8. Now we plot the points. If x is negative 3, y is 1 eighth. 1 eighth is going to be really close to the x-axis. And if x is negative 2, y is a fourth, well that's a half of a half. It's still pretty close to the x-axis. If x is negative 1, y is a half. If x is 0, y is 1. If x is 1, y is 2. If x is 2, y is 4. And if x is 3, y is off my chart. That means that this function is going to be going up as we move to the right. And what's it doing as we move to the left? It's bottoming out. It's getting closer to the x-axis. Is it ever going to cross it and become negative? There is not a power in the world you can raise a positive number to and get a negative number back. That's why I said be careful with the negative exponents. They never make the base negative. They just flip the side of the vinculum that the base is on. There's no symmetry here whatsoever, so I don't worry about the reflection. This happens to be a graph of the function f of x equals 2 to the x. In the next example, I'm going to ask you to graph 1 half to the x, and I want to compare and contrast the two. So if we have this function, I'm going to do it in purple. This is y equals 1 half to a power of x. So we're going to use the same x values, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. If x is negative 3, what is y now? 8, because that negative says flip the 1 half and make it a 2. And 2 cubed is 8. If x is negative 2, what's y? If x is negative 1, y is? If x is 0, y is? If x is 1, y is 1 half? 
one fourth, one eighth. So now we come along and we plot these points. They're kind of a mirror image across the y-axis. So if x is negative 3, y is off the chart. If x is negative 2, y is 4. If x is negative 1, y is 2. Notice the y values are the same when x is 0. So what we see with our graph is that we do see a mirror image now or a reflection across the y-axis. What Benjamin has observed is that if y is equal to 1 half to the x, that's the same thing as 2 to the negative x, which takes this graph of 2 to the x and reflects it about the y-axis. That's one of our transformations, and we are going to be seeing how to graph using transformations. Let y equals f of x be our function. Then y equals f of negative x takes the graph of y equals f of x and reflects it about the y-axis. And we see that. Now let's look at these two functions. What is the domain of each of these functions? All real numbers. What is the range? Can it be equal to zero? So we're going to use a parenthesis there. What about our intercept? What about an asymptote? We have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. Now, what did the fact that this base was 2 and this base was 1 half, what did it do to the shape of our graph? It changed it from an increasing function, oops, increasing function to a decreasing function. So those are really the only differences between these two graphs. So what we see is for y equals a to the x. If a is bigger than 1, it's an increasing function. If a is between 0 and 1, it's a decreasing function. And all of that ends up being summarized here in the properties of these functions. So the differences are what's notable. Everything's the same except Right here, if the base is bigger than 1, we have an increasing function. It's still a 1 to 1 function. And if the base is between 0 and 1, we have a decreasing function. But all of the other properties are exactly the same. The domains are the same, the range is the same, the intercepts are the same, the asymptotes are the same, the same points are on the graph. Because the function is 1 to 1, we know that it's invertible. We got that last time. And the inverse of an exponential function will be a logarithmic function. So I don't want to give away too much because the next section is logarithmic functions. So in general, this is what's going on. We will always have a horizontal asymptote with an exponential function. We will always have an intercept, a y-intercept at 0, 1. Now this is prior to any transformations. These are our new parent functions. One is increasing if the base is bigger than 1. One of them will be decreasing if the base is between 0 and 1, if it's a proper fraction. That's all that means. This part right here just means the base is a proper fraction. Now we're going to use our transformations. And if you remember, I think we went over this, we have y equals f of x minus h plus k. Actually, we had a a in front, negative a. Remember what the negative did? Flipped across the x-axis. The a stretches if bigger than 1, shrinks if between 0 and 1. So like that 16 would stretch things vertically. f is just the name of your parent function. Ladies and gentlemen, we just have two new parent functions is all now. Okay, they're called exponential. h is a horizontal shift. You see it inside the parent function, inside an exponential function. Where do you think that would be? In the exponent. k is a constant just stuck outside the function. So on this function, let's look at the transformations we have. What does that negative do right here? We can rewrite this function. The reason I don't put the negative here for the reflection about the y-axis is because we can manipulate that negative out of here. If you reflect about the y-axis, you change an increasing to a decreasing and vice versa. We'll change and the base does the same. You can rewrite this as 2 to the negative 1 raised to the x. Because when you raise a power to a power, you multiply the exponent. And negative 1 times x is negative x. So we're going to take this function and we're going to rewrite it as f of x equals 1 half raised to the x minus 3. So looking at this rewritten function with the positive in the exponent, 
What do we know about this function? Look at the transformations. What does this minus 3 do? It moves everything down 3. So normally your asymptote is right here at the y equals 0. Now it's going to be down here at y equals negative 3. So we sketch it in a dotted line. No, it's not because that's the base. That means that it's going to be decreasing. So normally we have a intercept at 0, 1. But where is that intercept moved to now? It's gone down here to not negative 3, but negative 2. Because it was normally right here at 1. And it moved down 1, 2, 3. So there it is now. So now it's going to be a decreasing graph. So can we get some more points? We could. If you want to get more points, you can be more precise. But we've got the shape. Unless there's a stretch, that will change it. So our function now is going to be decreasing. So we know that it's going to go off like this. And when you graph these exponential functions, I want you to first figure out where the asymptote is. And then I want you to plot where the intercept moved to. And then I want you to make sure that you're getting the shape right. Those are the three things that I'm going to be checking for on your test. Do you know where the asymptote is? Did you move the intercept to the right location? And do you have the shape right? By shape, I mean increasing and decreasing. Now, if I were to grab this graph and slide everything back up, I would have the graph of y equals 1 half to the x. All I did was I grabbed this graph and I shifted everything down 3. But the shape didn't change. The question was, how do you know if the graph is increasing or decreasing? To tell if it's increasing or decreasing, you read the graph like you read a book from left to right. So as we move from left to right, this graph is going down. This is not a negative 2. I'm, I'm glad you asked because this, this is going back on those properties of exponents. I'm using this property right here in combination with this one. So I started with 2 to the negative x. So I took my 2 to the negative x and I said, well, that's the same thing as negative 1 times x. But looking at this property, if you have multiplication on your exponents, you can rewrite it as a power raised to a power. So that's going to be the same thing as 2 to the negative 1 raised to a power of x. Do you see that I've gone from this side of the equation over to this side now? And now I said, well, 2 to the negative 1 is 1 half to the positive 1 using that property of negative exponents. So that's where I got the 1 half raised to an x. The down and dirty easy way to remember it is if you see a negative in the exponent, flip the base. Okay, you want a corny thing to help you remember it, corny things work. Think of the positive exponent and negative exponent as a happy exponent and a sad exponent. If you're positive, you're happy with where you are. If you're negative, you're sad with where you are. And you need to move in order to be happy. If you're sad on top of the vinculum, move to the bottom and make yourself happy. It's corny, but you'll remember it. Good question. Where did I get this yeah. negative 2? Normally, your y-intercept is right here. It got shifted down 3. So I take this point and I move it down 1, 2, 3. Now we're going to define the number e. e is a transcendental number. It's approximately equal to 2.718218, so forth and so on. Pi is a transcendental number that's approximately 3.14159, da, 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 da. They're transcendental numbers that are non-repeating. They are an, an, an entity in and of themselves. They are a number, a real number. But how we come up with the number e in college algebra, we just tell you it's a number and there it is. In pre-cal, we're trying to get you ready for calculus. So we go through this limiting process. It's going to be the number represented by 1 plus 1 over n as raised to the n as n goes off to infinity. We can write that then as a limit. And you can see this limiting process right here. If we start with n equals 1, 1 over n is going to be 1. So 1 plus 1 over n would be 1 plus 1. And we raise that then to the first, and we still get 2. But then as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, we start seeing these values of this approach that 2.718281827, blah, blah, blah. This is what the graph of that looks like. It's an exponential function where e is a constant, and it's a constant bigger than 1, 
So it's going to be an increasing function here. Your parent function is exponential. The base is bigger than 1. It's 2 point something. So we have an increasing function. Graphing exponential functions using their transformation. So we're going to graph this function and determine the domain, range, and horizontal asymptote. OK, you ready? What effect does this negative right here have on the function? It's going to be reflected about, and then this minus 3 is going to do what? To the right 3, not down. That minus 3 is in the exponent, so it's a horizontal shift. Is this going to be increasing or decreasing? The base is bigger than 1, so it would be an increasing function. But when you flip it across the x-axis, it will now be a decreasing function. So we take this shape, and when we flip it, we end up with this shape. So we've got to make sure we get the shape right. So there's three things I'm interested in. The asymptote, the intercept, and the shape. We've got to get that right. right. So we start out with our increasing function. Our asymptote, by the way, is where? There's no vertical shift. So our asymptote is still here. When I take this increasing function and I flip it across the y-axis, where is that intercept going to be? That intercept is going to be at negative 1. But now I've got to shift it to the right three units. So I'm going to go one, two, three units to the right, and that's going to put it right here. And now I sketch my graph asymptotic to the x-axis, and it's now decreasing. Do you see why it's decreasing and why the point that I have labeled here gets moved where it does? This point that was at 0, 1 is now at 3, negative 1 because of the reflection and the horizontal shift. Always on your parent function, the y-intercept is going to be at 0, 1. Your parent function prior to any transformation is this function, right? To find the y-intercept, you replace x with, and anything raised to a power of 0 is. So that's why 0, 1 will always be the y-intercept, no matter what, prior to any transformations. We were asked to find the domain. What is the domain? All real numbers. That doesn't change. What is the range now? OK, we go smallest to largest, so we would say negative infinity to 0. And the horizontal asymptote? at y equals 0. We have a 1 to 1 property of exponents. No, it's easy to tell that we have a 1 to 1 property because this graph passes. It's a function. It passes the vertical line test. It's also 1 to 1 because it passes the horizontal line test. What that means is if we have a, a base raised to a power equal to a base raised to a power, then the powers have to be equal if the bases are equal. That comes in handy when we try to solve equations like this. We're going to use this one-to-one -one property in order to solve these equations. So I need to be able to rewrite 32 as a power of 2. And 32 happens to be 2 to the fifth. If you don't have your powers of 2 memorized, now would be a good time to do it. Now using this one-to-one -one property of exponents, what can I set equal to each other? 3x minus 1 equals 5. Because my bases here are equal. If the bases are equal, I'm looking at this situation that says, then I can set the exponents equal. Now this is just a linear equation, and I can solve it. Come along and I add 1, and that's going to give me 3x equals 6. So x is equal to 2. 3 times 2 is 6. 6 minus 1 is 5. 2 to the 5th is 32. It checks out. Now let's solve this problem. Well, that looks scary. That's right. It's not really scary because I can rewrite this as e raised to the 2x minus 1 equals e to the negative 3x times e to the negative 4x. Because when you raise a power to a power, you multiply the exponents. In order to get this term into the numerator, I make the exponent negative. Multiply with a common base, what do you do to the exponents? Add them. So this becomes e raised to the negative 7x. So because the bases are now equal to each other, this property is going to apply. And what can I set up to solve then? 2x minus 1 equals negative 7x. Can I solve this equation? Sure, I would hope so. So what is x equal to? x is equal to 1 9th. 
Can you go back and check that? Sure you can. Knock yourself out. Do it with a calculator, though. All right, let's look at how we can use exponential functions then in order to solve problems. It says between 9 p.m. and 10 p.m., cars arrive at Burger King's drive through at a rate of 12 cars per hour or 0.2 cars per minute. The following formula from statistics can be used to determine the probability that a car will arrive within t minutes of 9 p.m. So here we have f of t equals 1 minus e raised to the negative 0.2t. You don't have to know how they came up with that formula. I believe it's a Poisson probability distribution function. Determine the probability that a car will arrive within 5 minutes of 9 p.m. That is before 9.05 p.m. So what are we going to do? What does t represent? t represents the time in minutes. So we're looking for f of 5. So that's going to be 1 minus e raised to the negative 0.2 times 5, or negative 0.1. e raised to the negative 1, sorry, right? So here we go. Let's type it into our calculator. Better yet, because I know they're going to make us graph this later on, I'm going to go ahead and type it in here. I have 1 minus e raised to the negative 0.2, and I have to use x for my variable. I don't get a choice in that. So I'm going to do a zoom 6 just to get a standard window, although it doesn't make sense to talk about negative time. And that way I can look at my function using second calculate, evaluated at 5. When x is 5, f of 5 is 0.63. So determine the probability that a car will arrive within five minutes. Well, there's a 63% chance that the car will arrive within five minutes. Part B says determine the probability that a car will arrive within 30 minutes of 9 p.m. That is before 9.30 p.m. Which means that I need to change my window because it won't give me a value that goes beyond the window, I don't think. So let's change the window to include um, a bunch. And second count. And now my value is going to be 30. And there's a 99.75% chance that a car will arrive within 30 minutes prior to. F of 30 is going to be equal to... 0.9975, so we would say there's a 99.75% chance. So then it says graph f using a graphing utility. We did. What value does f approach as t becomes unbounded in the positive direction? It approaches 1. If you look at the graph, you can see that it approaches 1, and if it helps, we can change our window so that the y values go from 0 to 2. And you can see how the graph looks. It's approaching 1, clearly. <coughs> well, that makes sense, because this should be a 100% chance. Eventually, this would be the greatest that maxes out at that point. On your notes, I've included a summary of what we've learned so far about the exponential functions. Here they are. The domain, the range. There are no x-intercepts. We have a horizontal asymptote. We have a y-intercept at 1 and all of this stuff. You need to be as familiar with this as you are with the back of your hand.